This is part five of statistics for trauma research. Uh, today we'll uh, do uh, just some introductions to multivariable statistics. We'll talk about linear regression uh, and multiple logistic regression and a couple of other things that are important to have in your statistical toolbox. So last time, well, Previously, we've, we've talked about univariate statistics. Univariate statistics are just when you have one predictor or independent variable and one outcome or dependent variable. And talked about uh, things like the t-test and ANOVA. Those are when, you're, um, when your data fit certain parameters. That's parametric testing. When they don't fit those parameters, we do non-parametric tests. <coughs> and, um, and we talked about some of that last time. And we have this whole decision tree on, on which test is going to be appropriate to use according to the type of variables you have and the number of groups that you're comparing. Uh, these in here in the, the ordinal uh, column here are, are the non-parametric tests. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be using a lot of chi-square, t-test, ANOVA, uh, things like that. But what if we have couple of situations. Uh, one is that uh, there's a continuous predictor variable against a continuous outcome variable. So that would be more of a correlation analysis. And uh, another is when we have multiple independent variables that you wanted uh, to incorporate into the analysis. So what if more than one factor contributes to the outcome? <clears throat> so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about confounding and effect modification and, uh, and look at a couple different types of multiple regression analyses. So uh, just some epidemiological and statistical terms here. Confounding is just the distortion of an effect of a risk factor on an outcome. Uh, the uh, example of, of confounding is there was a, a study that, that found an association between coffee consumption and a certain type of cancer. Uh, in, uh, in, a, in a particular study. This was, a, this was actually a surprising finding uh, until they realized that they had not um, considered whether or not the, the people smoked or not. And it turned out that, that people who drink a lot of coffee are more likely than, than, than people who don't uh, to, to smoke. And so, so they uh, found that, that that actually was contributing to the effect. <coughs> Effect modification is when you, uh, the relationship changes depending on the level of a third variable. And, um, and so it's a, it's a subtle difference be, uh, between the two, but important. Um, and we can uh, go through and, and do uh, our whole step-by-step uh, -step analysis and, uh, and, uh, and look at um, all of that. This is uh, an example that snuck into this presentation. Um, but um, but uh, correlation analysis is what I want to talk about uh, when, uh, when we have a, an, a, a continuous independent variable against a continuous dependent variable. So when we're just uh, quantifying the association between two continuous variables, uh, what we get out of a correlation analysis is called the correlation coefficient, uh, sometimes called the Pearson correlation coefficient, uh, also known as little r. Um, and R can range from negative one to positive one. The closer it gets to an absolute value of one, it's the, the, the stronger the relationship, the more uh, predictive power you have. Um, <coughs> closer to zero, the, the less uh, the, the data actually follow, uh, follow the line. And, uh, and the sign indicates the, the direction of the association. So positive sign means, uh, means a positive correlation, negative sign means negative correlation. As one goes up, the other goes down. Um, it's uh, limited in, uh, in that uh, it's, it's only good for linear association. So, if, uh, so if, there's, if the association between two variables follows a curve, uh, which is often the case with age, um, then, it's, uh, uh, then it's not as reliable for that. The other thing we get out of it is called R squared. That's called the coefficient of, of determination. If you ever see the term R squared, uh, the, the proportion of the variability in the outcome variable that is explained by the uh, uh, by the the independent variable. All right, so getting in your time machine and going back to high school uh, to geometry class, um, you may recall this equation: y equals m x plus b, and that is the equation of a straight line. 
Uh, in this case, b is the y-intercept. That's the, the, the value of y when x equals 0. <coughs> and, uh, and m is the slope. So this is the slope-intercept equation. Uh, and so that's, uh, the slope is how much the value of y changes for every one unit change in the value of x. We actually use that, but we write it a little bit differently for linear regression analysis. We call it y hat. Um, y hat is, uh, just means that it's an estimate of, of y. Uh, and, uh, and, those, uh, and the m and the b are actually both called b, but they have, uh, have different name tags on them. The b naught is the y-intercept, and, uh, and b1 is going, to be, um, is going to be the slope on that. <coughs> so uh, that would be just simple linear regression. Multiple, uh, we, can, we can extend this to multiple linear regression by adding uh, multiple variables. Uh, and if we think of, the, uh, of the, the simple line as being a y-axis and an x-axis, if you add a third variable, that's that z-axis going straight out at you, and then uh, you can actually add more variables like that. But I'm not a good enough artist to draw that, so we won't. But, uh, but each of these different values of b represents the, the change in the value of y for each one unit change in that particular variable. Great example is just the circumference of a circle, um, where, where the, it's actually represented by a formula. Circumference is 2 pi r. Uh, and you can, uh, you can say plus 0, so because the, the value of, uh, of the circumference when the radius is 0 is 0. Uh, and you can follow that all the way uh, all the way up. Um, if we model that here, uh, it's uh, it's going to be just a, a 6.2832x plus zero. Uh, and in this case, r squared is going to be one because it's a, pre a perfect predictor of uh, of the circumference if you if you know the radius. But in biostatistics, um, we very rarely actually have uh, a, a perfect predictor. And so I was looking for, uh, for some examples here. And, uh, and one that was, was easy to find was uh, uh, you can go online and, and find the rosters of, uh, of any professional football team uh, and see uh, what the, uh, um, the relationship is between height and weight. And, uh, and as I was saying before with correlation analysis, um, we've got R, the, the the, the correlation coefficient um, that ranges from negative one to positive one, as you might expect. As players get taller, they also get heavier. Um, <coughs> but, uh, but R squared tells us that uh, only with an R squared value of 0.5289, um, just over half of the variability in weight is actually explained by the variability in height. We see actually quite a lot of scatter uh, around this line. This is the um, uh, this is the regression line here, and you can think of, of course, you think of all the players on a football field. Um, there are uh, advantages to being heavier in some positions than in other positions, uh, and so, um, so so it's it's understandable that uh, that there would be uh, quite a bit of variability in that. <coughs> if we look at the uh, at the the regression equation. Um, this, uh, this, again, this reg regression line uh, is just the line that minimizes the distance between the, uh, these, these dots, the actual observations, and the line. So, uh, so it's generated by the, the computer using something called least squares analysis. And, um, <coughs> and so uh, but, uh, when it boils down to is, uh, is this is actually that, that equation for the line. So, for each unit increase, for, for a one inch increase in height, uh, the typical increase in weight is about 13 pounds uh, for, uh, for a professional football player. <coughs> and, uh, and again, we've got the you know, R squared the ex explaining about half of the, uh, the, the change. Uh, R squared is the coefficient of determination. Uh, again, proportion of variance in Y explained by X. Um, it's actually the ratio of the deviation in this regression line from, from the overall mean to that plus the, the, um, the deviation of the observations to the point on the line. Um, 
and r is the correlation coefficient between negative one and positive one. Uh, the, the sign is the same as the slope, so positive 13, positive r. Um, and uh, and the, the magnitude is related to how uh, how close the, uh, the the association is. Okay, if we look at, at a different example, different kind of football players, um, soccer players you see much less scatter uh, around that line, and so that relates to uh, to that R value of uh, we see that's uh, quite a bit higher at 0.89, and R square is uh, uh, is 0.8, so 80 percent of the variability in weight is actually explained by uh, by player height and that. And that makes sense. They run around a lot. They all do basically the same thing. Those of you who play soccer, don't criticize me on that. I just don't follow it. All right. <coughs> but back to our, our real football players. Um, <coughs> um, I figured, okay, yes. Um, we, we can probably assume that, that, that depending on the position, uh, the, the weight's going to be different. And, uh, and so I sorted these out according to, to whether they are uh, classified as linemen or not. Being that uh, you get the big beefy guys uh, on the line there, and uh, and sure enough, uh, the red dots here are those that are the offensive or defensive linemen. Blue dots are everybody else. We've got one guy here that's kind of standing out um, here because he looks a little more similar to everybody else. He's a long snapper. We'll get into that. Actually, we won't get into that. <coughs> Just kind of interesting, uh, and we can see they actually follow two different uh, regression lines here, um, and uh, and they seem pretty much parallel uh, to each other. And going back to, to our uh, our equation for uh, for linear regression, uh, we we can take a look at uh, at both of those together. So, <coughs> the way we would approach in a study is first to, to examine each of those uh, those individually. So by doing a univariate analysis, uh, comparing height and weight, we just do a, a Pearson correlation. Um, and uh, and so to do that uh, in our SPSS uh, program, go to analyze, correlate, and then go to bivariate. And what that returns is this uh, this correlation matrix. And so for uh, for each pair of variables, you can look at okay, there's height, there's weight. Uh, we've got the correlation coefficient, 0.727. We've got the significance, um, 0 0.000 is highly significant, uh, and, the, and the sample size. Um, this actually flags the significant correlations uh, by putting these asterisks here, and we can say that that's significant at the 0.01 level. <coughs> so, all right, so that's one we're, we're going to want to uh, take another look at. Um, what about weight? Um, by uh, by whether they're on the line or not, uh, well, that's that's going to be two independent samples, and so that's going to be our independent samples t test. Uh, and so to to get to that again, go to analyze compare means because we want to compare the average weights, um, and choose independent samples t test. And the grouping variable is going to be whether they're on the line or not, and we're going to indicate that as as one they are on the line, zero they're not, uh, and the test variable is going to be weight. And that returns uh, the actual mean values here. Uh, the the a the average uh, value for for the lineman was 309 pounds, if you can believe that. Um, and for everybody else was 225. Um, so that's a, a difference between the two of uh, of 84 pounds. Um, and here's our actual test. The uh, first part here uh, actually looks to see whether the variances are equal. Um, and and so we look at the significance of that. If that's less than 0.05, then we conclude, conclude that the variances are not equal. We go down to the next line, uh, and we look at the t-test here. Uh, either, either one we look at. In this case, they're both significant. Um, so, so we can say with quite a bit of confidence that, uh, that linemen are quite a bit heavier than everybody else. Um, and we've got a confidence interval. So <coughs> using that information, um, uh, we want to know how these two variables relate to each other in predicting uh, a player's weight. So to do that, uh, we're going to uh, perform a regression. Um, and, uh, and to do that, we just choose uh, from regression, go to linear, because we figure these uh, pretty much follow a straight line. Uh, and the dependent variable, remember the dependent is the outcome variable. It depends on the values of everything else. Um, so that, that's going to be weight. Independent variables are going to be height and 
whether they're on the line or not. And there are some options in, uh, uh, <coughs> in linear regression. Um, and what we're going to want to see is, uh, is how much the, the R-squared value changes. Remember, R-squared is, um, is that coefficient of determination. It's the, the, the amount of variability in the outcome variable that's, uh, uh, that's um, accounted for by the, uh, by the dependent variables. Um, and see how well the model fits. And, uh, and uh, we definitely want the, the estimates there. Um, <coughs> we can also save some variables to, to each individual. Uh, and so uh, for each individual observation, uh, we, can, uh, we can look at what the predicted value would be if they were actually on that regression line uh, and, and save that value for, uh, for later analysis uh, and see how much they, uh, they differ from that. And that would be the residuals. <coughs> and there are a number of other things we've, uh, that we can get into in more detail later. But so here's what the, uh, what the linear regression output looks like. And so R square is going to be how well does the model predict the outcome. So that's uh, overall, uh, how good is this model? And 84%, uh, that's pretty good. The adjusted R square is, uh, is if you were to take this model and apply it to a different set of variables, a different set of observations, um, that's, uh, that's how, it would, uh, how well that would predict. Um, and you can see that's always going to be a little bit lower than the, the regular R square. And there goes Alan having fun with animation again. Um, this ANOVA table is just the test of the model to see um, how it differs from, uh, from chance. So how significant is this model overall? Uh, and we can see, yeah, this, uh, this model does predict uh, much better than, the, than by chance alone um, because it, it, has a, it, it is highly significant. Okay, <clears throat> but here is, uh, af after you've gone through and said, okay, well, is, is this model good or not? These coefficients are uh, really what, what you're probably gonna wanna look at because, uh, uh, because often in linear regression, you want to build a model that can predict something. Uh, and so, so we want to, to end up with that equation for the line. And that's what this equation is. That's what these numbers are. So we've got uh, over here constant, that's going to be the y-intercept. Um, and height and line are the independent variables. So each of those would be the slopes um, for, those, uh, for those specific variables. <coughs> so if you have a set of, uh, of, um, of data for a, uh, for a particular person, you can predict what their, what their weight would be. We also have these standardized coefficients here. Now the standardized coefficient uh, converts all of those coefficients to the same, uh, to the same units. So, uh, so in other words, for, for one standard deviation change in the dependent variable, um, how many uh, uh, standard de deviations would the independent variable change? And, uh, and that's, uh, a lot of people think of that as, as a better way of comparing the variables to see which one predicts uh, better uh, with, uh, with, with, with more accuracy. Um, and you can see that, uh, that whether they're on the line or not um, has, has a lot more weight there than, uh, than height does. And, and this part is uh, t-tests t and significance. So, so these are the significance tests for these individual variables. And, uh, and we can see that, that they are independently uh, significant. And, uh, and then we end up with, uh, uh, with confidence intervals for those as well. All right. Um, issues with linear regression, uh, one is that it assumes that the relationship is linear. Uh, if, it, uh, if it's curvilinear, if it's quadratic, something like that, uh, you may have to do some kind of a, a transformation. Uh, it's important to get to know your data, look at it graphically, uh, before you go diving into uh, a, a linear regression. Uh, the other thing is multicollinearity. That's, uh, that's when you have uh, two or more independent variables that are so strongly related to each other that it becomes redundant 
to, to put them both in and, uh, and you lose some of the impact of, uh, of each individual one. All right, so that was linear regression. As you might imagine, there is a lot more that can be said about that. <laughs> but that was uh, just the basics. Uh, now I will cover very briefly logistic regression. Um, logistic regression is when your outcome is dichotomous. There's just a, is, it's a yes or no outcome, success, failure. Um, and uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can model that as a, as a probability. Um, because you, what, what this is trying to do is, is basically cram the same type of idea uh, into, a, into a linear model. Uh, but if, uh, if your only possible outcomes are yes or no, it's tough to make that look linear. Um, so what you do is, uh, is model the, uh, the odds. So the, uh, remember the odds is the, the probability divided by one minus the probability. So, the, so this is actually looking at the logarithm of the odds um, is, the, uh, um, is the logistic regression. It's also called the, uh, the logit. Uh, and I took a look, and this is going to be a little bit difficult to read, at uh, some variables using, uh, using the, the Switters data, that's the car crash data for San Diego County, um, about uh, the predictors for, uh, for whether the, somebody involved in a motor vehicle occupant crash is going to die. Um, and uh, and there, were, uh, there were some that, that popped out. Uh, it looked like there was a, an increase in, uh, in death rate uh, as people got over age 75. You can see relative risk for that is 5.44. It's pretty high. Uh, I was curious about hit and run. That ends up not being quite as significant. Um, the uh, high energy versus low energy collision. High energy is when you're uh, running into a solid object or overturning uh, or, uh, or head-on collisions versus, uh, versus side swipe. Um, that, uh, that's, uh, that, that has a, a very uh, large relative risk. And, uh, and you can see some of the others, uh, wh whether that the, uh, the party was, uh, was drinking alcohol um, <coughs> gender, uh, whether that party was at fault, whether the victim was ejected, that's huge. Um, time of day and, and seat belt use. Um, I'm just going to look at a couple of these uh, so this doesn't get too ugly. Um, as you might imagine, some of these are very much related to each other. I was looking at alcohol versus seat belts. And it turns out that people who drive drunk are less likely to wear a seatbelt. <coughs> I know that's probably a big surprise. Um, but um, we can look overall, the, uh, the relative risk of, uh, of death in a motor vehicle occupant crash for people who have been drinking uh, is 4.44. Uh, so, uh, so if you've been drinking, you elevate your, uh, your risk of, of death in a car crash by four times. <coughs> um, but what if we separate that out according to, to whether they had a seatbelt on or not? Um, basically, if they're not wearing a seatbelt, um, that drops to, to only 1.55. So you put the same person not wearing a seatbelt, um, uh, and yeah, whether they're, uh, whether they're drinking or not, they've got a pretty high risk of death uh, because they're not wearing a seatbelt. Um, but um, but if, uh, if they, they are wearing a seatbelt, then, um, then whether they're drinking makes a big difference. And so you can see that, that relative risk changes. Um, quite a bit according to uh, whether they're, they're wearing a seatbelt. But, uh, but how do we get a common relative risk adjusting for seatbelt use? Well, that's uh, where we use this cochrane mantle hansel method that, uh, that, uh, uh, that basically gives you a pooled relative risk adjusting for that third variable um, and accounting for that, that confounding. So the idea is to, to stratify the data according to levels of the, that third variable, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, then calculate a, a pooled estimate of the relative risk. So the, uh, the idea is that you're going to create subgroups where the confounder varies less. If it's, a, if, uh, if it's a, a discrete variable, like whether or not they wore a seat belt, then all of that variability is gone. If it's continuous, like age, you're just decreasing that, that variability um, as much as you can, um, with the assumption that there's no meaningful variability within the categories. And um, 
And then by pooling the data, you assume that there's going to be a constant effect across the strata of, uh, of, of that third variable. And then you take the weighted average of those stratum specific measures. So whoever has the most data gets the most weight. <coughs> this is the actual equation. It's, uh, it's very much related to, uh, to the, the actual relative risk. Remember, uh, relative risk was uh, the probability of, uh, of being a case assuming that you're uh, exposed divided by the probability of uh, being a case ex assuming that you're not exposed. Um, and so the mantle Hansel just um, carries that over through these uh, multiple stratified tables. So in our example, the um, stratifying the, those out and calculating that, that, that pooled mantle Hansel relative risk, we end up with a, uh, with a relative risk of 2.62, quite a bit lower than the, um, uh, than the, the overall unadjusted relative risk. But if, uh, if we want to adjust for um, that, uh, that third variable, whether they were wearing a seatbelt or not, this is uh, the, the, um, the adjusted relative risk for, uh, for, uh, for alcohol. Okay. The other thing we could do, is so that, and that's, that's fine if we've got only two variables, but, uh, but if we have multiple variables, uh, then logistic regression is, uh, is uh, probably going to be a little better tool because you can, uh, you can attack that all at once. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, logistic regression is where the outcome is dichotomous. Um, and, uh, and we're looking at the log odds, but I already said that. Um, in SPSS, we're going to go down to, uh, within the, the analyze menu, go down to regression and choose binary logistic because we've got two possible outcomes. It's logistic regression. And um, what I did for, for this one, I looked at, uh, well, whether the party had been drinking uh, and, uh, and whether active restraint is, uh, is if they were wearing a seat belt. And, uh, and uh, in the Switters database, we also have the model year of the vehicle. Now, there's been, uh, it's been hypothesized that uh, the reason, one of the reasons we're seeing a much lower death rate recently is because of the improvements in, in vehicle design. And so I looked at, uh, at pre-2000 versus post-2000 um, for, uh, for the model year of the vehicle. And again, uh, with logistic regression, just like linear regression, there's a, a number of options. Uh, you can get, you can, uh, you can save variables within each observation to see what the probability was of death or uh, whatever outcome it is that you're looking at. Um, and, uh, and you can look at uh, how well the model fits uh, and a, num a number of other options in this. Um, and what, what I really want to focus on here is, uh, is just the, uh, the equation part of this. Uh, and for, for this, Again, uh, the, the equation is going to be modeled pretty much the same. The constant is going to be uh, essentially the intercept. Um, and then we, we have these, uh, these coefficients here. The interpretation is a little bit different in logistic regression than it is for linear regression. With linear regression, uh, you look at the coefficient and say, OK, for one unit increase in, uh, in my independent variable, that's how much the dependent variable changes. Um, but, uh, but remember, the logistic regression is looking at the log of the odds. So that confuses things a little bit. Um, we'll get back to this. Uh, Wald and degrees of freedom and significance. This is just the significance test for that individual variable. <coughs> and uh, what is important to look at here in, in this table is the exponent of the coefficient. Um, this is just this coefficient exponentiated. And what that gives you is great. That, what that gives you is actually the odds ratio for that variable adjusted for all the other variables in your model. So, uh, so in this case, the odds ratio for uh, that's party had been drinking uh, is, that, uh, is that variable, party HBD. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the odds ratio for that is 2.8, adjusting for whether they were wearing a seatbelt or not. And you can see this odds ratio is very low because this is uh, coded as one for wearing a seat belt and zero for not wearing a seat belt. So, um, so wearing a seat belt, of course, is highly, highly protective. Um, and, uh, and the other thing to look at is uh, this model year, uh, whether the, the car was, uh, was built before the year 2000 or not. 
uh, ends up not being significant after you've got uh, these two things in the model, which makes sense. Um, it's uh, that it's much more important to be uh, wearing a seatbelt and not drinking than it is to, to be uh, driving a 84 Thunderbird versus a um, you know, 2010 Volvo. <coughs> um, and so, uh, so if, this, if this were real, uh, we'd probably uh, kick that, that variable out of the model because it really doesn't add a whole lot. All right. But what can you do with this? Um, again, the, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at, at this, uh, and if we were just to look at the, the simple logistic regression with nothing else in the model, HPD has had been drinking. Um, again, the, the odds ratio is just the exponent of that coefficient. Um, and that by itself uh, has an odds ratio of 4.54. But once we add active restraint into the model, uh, we can calculate the odds ratio as the exponent of the, it, well, that drops down to 1.061, uh, and that odds ratio drops down to 2.89 uh, once active restraint is in the model. Okay. The other thing you can do is calculate risk given a set of risk factors. So calculate a, an individual's probability of having the outcome if you know whether they had been drinking during uh, seatbelt. Um, and if you have other uh, factors like age or uh, gender, if those end up being in your model. Um, and, uh, and that's actually uh, within trauma, how our probability of survival term was created. It's by using a logistic regression with a, um, uh, with a large national data set. Um, and so if, if this is the, the equation just for having those two variables in, uh, in the model, uh, the way we get pro the, uh, the risk of an individual with, the, with those two factors uh, is looking at the exponent of the overall equation divided by one plus the exponent of the overall uh, equation. So what's the risk of death in somebody who'd been drinking and not wearing a seatbelt? Um, important to know how these are coded. Uh, had been drinking is coded as uh, one if yes and zero if no. Active restraint is one if yes and zero if no. Um, so you, uh, plugging those into the model um, gives us, uh, well, we just multiply the coefficient for, for alcohol by one and the coefficient for uh, seat belts by zero. Um, and we get, uh, we get this outcome, negative 2.441. Uh, exponent of that is uh, 0 0.087. Uh, and if we uh, do that uh, exponent divided by one plus that exponent, uh, we end up with 0 0.08. So the, so the risk of an individual uh, who is not wearing a seatbelt, out joyriding, drunk, uh, is about 8%, uh, assuming they're actually in a crash. So that's pretty bad. Um, if they are wearing a seatbelt, of course, that's quite a bit lower. Um, <clears throat> all right, so just to sum up, um, Usually there is more than one out, uh, factor that contributes to an outcome, so that's why multivariable methods are important uh, to use. And, uh, and usually we're going to use either um, uh, linear regression or logistic regression uh, for that. Those are two popular ways to, to approach that. Next time, we're going to talk about sample size and power. So, uh, so if we've uh, got our, uh, our clinical trials, how many people are we going to need? Uh, in order to find a significant outcome. That's all I have to say today. <laughs>